very much, Mania, for the introduction. Um, I'm so grateful to be here today. Um, yeah, let me start at. So today I'm going to talk about my work uh, designing an optimal protection strategy for coastal sea level rise. Uh, this is a joint work of Columbia University and also NCAR, National Center of Atmospheric Research in Colorado Boulder. And also this is funded by NSF. Okay, so let me first start with what happened with Hurricane Sandy. Um, I believe most of people here were in US uh, back in 2012 when Hurricane Sandy landed in October. So let me go through with the numbers uh, what actually Hurricane Sandy did. So it was uh, originally a tropical cyclone and came to north east side of US mostly and it caused a damage uh, 65 billion dollars in the United States and also for New York City it caused 19 billion dollars and also it killed 233 people and eventually 5.5 million people did not have a power uh, in northeast of US and how the damage actually looked like around New York City uh, I'm gonna show some pictures so this is Tuck Carton in New Jersey. So this area is pretty low rise. And as you can see in the picture, um, all the buildings or houses are isolated. It's like inside of the lake. And yeah, it was pretty bad. And of course, uh, we have Rockaways in New York. This area is in Long Island. And this whole area was inundated heavily and as you can see, some of the area was completely flooded and this area, especially uh, these low rising housing, especially wooden structures are completely destroyed and demolished. And not only these houses, we had uh, some problem for tunnels. And this is one of the tunnels between Brooklyn and Manhattan. It's under East River. Uh, this Brooklyn tunnel was completely flooded and this is just only one of them and there are actually four of them and these are also completely flooded and it took a few days to pump it out. Also 14th Street, <coughs> it's in Lower Manhattan and normally it's a very populated area crowded for shopping and dining but as you can see the flooding height was pretty high and even car was in the water. So of course there was no people and it was causing a lot of damage. And this is another example from lower Manhattan. It's a South Ferry station, tip of Manhattan, very south. And this is one line train of MTA. And the very unfortunate thing was uh, this station was renovated like right before this event happened. And of course, after this, it was completely destroyed and they needed to spend a lot of money to renew this uh, station again. And I have been talking about physical damage, but there were also power outages in Manhattan. So there is an electric utility facility in Midtown East. And this facility was completely flooded and also partially exploded. So in the night of October 29th, there was a green light in the sky. Everyone was like, what's happening? Is it like an uh, apocalypse? But afterwards, um, the whole lower Manhattan was completely uh, power outage and nobody had access to the power except this only tiny area of World Trade Center because they had a different source of this power. And because of this power outage, there was another uh, like severe problem, especially in the hospital. So there are several hospitals in the course line and these hospitals originally had the uh, generators. So they didn't need to evacuate patients because of power outage. That's what they thought originally, but the generator was unfortunately located in the basement. That was actually planned after 9-11, but it was not the best plan for hurricane or flooding. So after all, this generator didn't work and they needed to evacuate people 
during the hurricane and also flooding coming in. This is a map that uh, where critical infrastructures are located in lower Manhattan. So as you can see, um, these areas are flood zone. So there are so many critical infrastructures in the flood zone, even category one, which is in red part. Category one here means uh, the area where can be flooded with category one hurricane. So we can say this is pretty vulnerable and this is the electric utility that I was just talking about. So it's in category one hurricane zone and also very close to East River. And this kind of threat can be amplified because of climate change, especially sea level rise. So New York City has already some projections for the sea level rise. Uh, let's see, uh, middle estimate. For example, by 2050s, at least there's gonna be 28 centimeter of sea level rise. And if we check 2100, by then at least we can estimate it having 56 centimeter of sea level rise. And of course, if it's high estimate, of course it's highly unlikely to have, but this could go to two meter. And that's a very high number, like a six feet. So how they actually look like in the map in lower Manhattan. This is a map for Hurricane Sandy. So light blue color part is what actually happened during Hurricane Sandy. And I'm also putting some uh, inundated area with the middle estimate of sea level rise in 2050 and 2100. So as you can see, the area is expanding inward in lower Manhattan. So um, there is not going to be better future if we have another hurricane without taking any measure for that. Yeah, as I just said, sea level rise could only amplify the threat not the other way around. So what can we do for the future storms? Can we do anything to protect the city? Yes. So there are so many actually possible adaptation or protective measures or even strategy. For example, we have barriers. We can also raise individual buildings, maybe not in Manhattan, but like for example, in Long Island, Tuckerton, these small houses can be raised and also we have a seawall and we can also build some artificial dunes so that this can block the water and also slow down the speed of water. And also instead of constructing something very bulky like I just uh, introduced, we can do managed retreat, which means uh, relocating the community in this vulnerable area to somewhere else probably it's a little bit more uh, high elevated area or somewhere safer so that uh, we don't need to pump this never ending tons of sand. So I didn't introduce, but there are way more possible solutions. There are just a lot of them and it's very different scale as well. So one could be very big that can protect a whole you know, peninsula or coastline, or we can even see like individual manholes. And there are just so many types. So the question is, which strategy should we choose? And if we choose one or two, um, where should we implement that? And also timing is important. So when is the best timing to implement these strategies? Because if we need the if we need to protect the city like next year, we have to do it right away. But if we have actually some more time and economy is growing, maybe it's more reasonable to build those strategies or adaptation measures a little later. So the ultimate question is, what is the optimal solution given the budget? Um, since there's always a budget, this is a really critical component. So we define the optimal solution for this. Uh, the optimal solution should maximize reduction in losses. Losses means uh, includes damage, income, and many more. And also this can be a combination of multiple strategies. So it can be seawall 
or manhole, but also we can combine all these together. And also I, uh, this optimization strategy, uh, optimal strategy should be designed for the future storm. But the most important thing is we are not gonna have the same storm. For example, we will never ever gonna have exactly same Sandy and also same high tide. So we have to keep in mind that the future storm is highly uncertain. And also we have to account for stakeholders feedback, social equity, justice and acceptability because if the optimal solution makes sense for engineers or applied mass scientists, but if the community do not like it or stakeholders do not like it, then it's probably not going to be implemented. So we have to account for their comments, interviews and feedback and also social equity so that uh, everyone's gonna be uh, understand and agrees to construct or implement this kind of strategy. So we are proposing this optimization methodology framework. Um, first, we can start with strategy. Oops, sorry. The strategy, we can start with any potential strategy that you're interested in. And then we can parameterize this strategy into the target area. And using this strategy, we can do the flooding estimation. And to do this flooding model, we are using two models. Actually, we developed both of them. Um, one is this upper part, GISSR model, and the other one is GeoClo model. I'm going to talk about these two models in detail later, but for now, I'm going to just go on this optimization methodology. So after we figure out the flooding in the area, we can convert the flooding estimate to damage. So we can have losses in dollars using fragility curves. And this damage should be accounted for also stakeholders interviews so that we can understand the real damage cost in dollars. And then once we have this damage, we can check the suitability. If this potential strategy is the optimal or good, but not the best or not at all, like we can check that based on this cost of benefit analysis uh, using the damage cost and also investment costs that we have to use for this strategy. And also we can account for this stakeholder interviews and affected community comments so that we can know if this, uh, if this strategy is suitable for this community and also financially, socially, it's reasonable or not. And if yes, we can conclude this optimization, but if not, we have to go back to this strategy step again to have another strategy which is better than the previous one. So otherwise we can conclude that it's optimal strategy, which uh, that maximizes the reduction of losses given budget. So I'm gonna show you some example of this methodology. Our target area for now is New York City. So in New York City, there are four variable, uh, vulnerable areas and we are checking only lower Manhattan for this study right now. And I'm gonna only talk for that. So as input for the flood estimate, we have peak water level of future storm. This is generated probabilistically and we have two types of storms here. The ones in red dots are the ones in warm season that's from June to October. And the blue dots they are the storms in cold season, that's from uh, November to May. And these storms are pretty different physically, and red ones are more like tropical cyclone, and blue ones are more like nor'easter. Uh, this is the case for New York City, by the way. And then, since we are never sure about the future storms, we have, this is just the one example of 80 years from 2020 to 2100, but we have to make sure this strategy is optimal for uncertain future. So to make sure that we are using more of these, so 
we have like, for example, there are three figures and all of them are the same period from 2020 to 2100 over 80 years. But they are all different. As you can see, the, this one, the big one is just one, but this set of storms, we have pretty big storms, three of them. And these are like a mostly similar size. And I have to also mention that the storms in warm season are usually larger magnitude compared to the one in cold season. So as you can see, all the big storms or peak water surge is in red. And the one in blue, these are more smaller scale, but it's more frequent. So you see blue dots more often. So we have these different sets of storms. And through our simulation, we are using thousand simulations. So we put the thousand simulations plotted together here. You can see like so many storms, but these are all calculated. And then uh, the goal is to find the statistics of the losses so that we see the mean value of losses in the future by 2100. So once we have the flood estimation input, now we can move on to flood simulations. So as I said, we have two models and I'm gonna just start with GISSR. So GISSR stands for GIS-based subdivision redistribution model. As the name shows, it's based on geographic information system, GIS, and this can estimate flood height. And it's very computationally efficient. It's extremely efficient. Um, for example, this lower Manhattan case, it takes 0.1 second per storm. And since the, this tool is vectorized, if you have like multiple storms, hundreds, thousands, basically the computation time is the same. And because of this efficiency, this tool is best for now casting or rough estimate of the flooding. And this is used to find the rough estimation of the optimal solution in our methodology. So once we use this GISSR and then figure out the damage suitability and then uh, repeat this loop, then once we can narrow down the estimation of this optimal solution, we can move on to GeoClow. So GeoClow is computationally a little bit more expensive compared to GISSR, but it's a little more accurate as well. And um, Ge GeoClow is still computationally more efficient actually than the popular flood estimate tool, such as Adsur Slush. And this can estimate flood height and also currents. The currents just in case is the speed of water. And this GeoClow solves the shallow water equations and also <clears throat> As you can see on the right side of the video, the resolution changes. So because of this resolution change, the computation time is actually reduced significantly. And how this grid is decided is basically when hurricane approaches, that area is going to be precisely grid. But if the hurricane goes away or like just too far away in the beginning of that video, like, um, the grid is going to be coarse so that we don't need to calculate too much. So this geoflow is used to find the optimal solution after narrowing down the solution with GISSR. So this is more like a finalizing. And once we have flood estimate, we can check the damage. So damage cost in our methodology are separated into two. We have direct damage and indirect damage. Direct damage, including physical damage, income damage, and these can be computed with uh, the input of flood estimate and also building information. Building, building information includes uh, ground elevation and also building assets and usage. So using our damage functions, gradually curves, we can convert this information into damage estimate in uh, dollars. So this is an example for Lower Manhattan. And this uh, figure is for Hurricane Sandy specifically. So this shows damage percentage for every single building in Lower Manhattan. And based on this damage percentage, 
we can also compute the damage losses in dollars. So for example, the zoomed map here, we have three hospitals, NYU Hospital, Bellevue Hospital, also VA and New York Healthcare. These are all in red, as you can see. That means uh, the damage cost was at least $50 million. And I have to note that this uh, damage cost is only from the building physical damage and also the income damage because of inoperability. And it does not include the like medical equipment inside the building. And this type of medical equipment could like increase this total damage completely. So we have also indirect damage. And this indirect damage is mostly from uh, losses from interdependency. And interdependency is very different from town to town, city to city. So for our study for in this New York City, we are closely working with local stakeholders uh, for example, in New York City Mayor's Office and some transportation infrastructures as well. So let me show some preliminary results. Um, today, I wanted to show some simple example. So we simplify the model. Uh, we have only two protective measures considered here, elevated palm nerd and also seawall. And the variables we are optimizing is the height of the seawall and also the location. And the constraints, we have uh, this measure within the budget, of course, and also the wall height shouldn't be more than five meter. And how the optimization looks like is this. So we have three dots here and the red ones are the damage cost. So as you can see, this starts from $5 billion to zero in the end. And also we have measure cost. Measure cost is investment cost for the protective measure. And this goes up from zero. And also we have total cost. That's the summation of measure cost and also damage cost. And as you can see, when there is no budget, zero budget here, um, of course, the investment cost is going to be zero. And the total cost, which is equal to damage cost now, is $5 billion. And also, yeah, I have to mention that this cost is for 80 years from 2020 to 2100. And, but if we increase the budget, like for example, 1 billion, 2 billion, uh, the damage cost goes down and also the major cost goes up, of course. And as you can see, the total cost is also going down until this point, $2.1 billion. So we decided that this is optimal solution for this case, because this is uh, minimizing the damage cost, but also the total cost is not going up as well. Because after $2.1 billion, the total cost is going up and also the major cost is going up. So even though the damage cost is going to be zero, around $3 billion of budget, it's not really ideal and optimal based on our definition. Of course, some stakeholders prefer that having zero damage and willing to pay more, but this is not really ideal for our case. So for example, uh, since this plot doesn't really show like where we are building something, I'm going to show you some example. So this is half billion dollar budget. What we can do is having some sea walls like a very typical Manhattan in the south. And if we do have a little more money, like one billion dollars, we can extend that. And this optimal solution is ideally we can build a wall entire coastline so that there is no water overtopping. Maybe there's a bit but the most uh, important thing is the water is not actually traveling from the edge and then coming behind the wall. So as I just showed, um, 
different budget leads different protective measures and optimal solution as well. So at the $500 million budget, this is actually the optimal what we can do. But if we have like $2 billion, we can actually protect the city. So yeah, this is the summary. Uh, we propose this optimization methodology and we use two flooding methodologies here, GISSR and also GeoClow. And as input, we are also considering probabilistic future storms and eventually we find the optimal solution for the city. And future work, uh, we are planning to account for environmental ecological concerns and also uh, strategic retreat and financial instruments will be added as well. So instead of constructing something, we can do some other strategy like relocating people. It's hard to also uh, quantify in dollars, but we can still do that. And also some financial instruments such as like uh, catastrophe or resilience bonds or even insurance. So instead of building something and protect physically, we can probably invest to these financial products and then maybe protect the city afterwards. And also since this problem is very nonlinear and complicated, we are thinking to take some more of sophisticated optimization scheme. And of course, we are trying to actually apply this methodology to other cities. We started uh, some pre-processing for New Orleans. Okay, so I'd like to thank my collaborators, mentors. Um, yep, this is it. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead.